You're very welcome, Mick Rooney, investigative journalist, uh, Radio Aspoil. Quick briefs, uh, www.radioaspoil.com. Uh, you may even be watching this on uh, YouTube. And if you are, you already know it's uh, YouTube at uh, Mick Rooney. If you want to find me, we're also on social media. Look, it's all in the description. I'm not going to go through that. If you enjoy this broadcast, episode 34, uh, you already know the case we're going to cover. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, thank you all to my most recent uh, subscribers. Uh, you're all very welcome here. Um, and this is the way we flow. Uh, without further ado, Kieran, as always, is going to be joining us very soon. I'm just going to go through a brief of the case. Uh, episode 34. As you've seen from the text and the thumbnail, uh, we're dealing with the Claire Boylan missing case. Just a brief background on this case. At the time of her disappearance, Claire Boylan was 36 years of age, single and living with her parents in Ternure, which is somewhat considered an upmarket South Dublin um, suburb in Ireland. Ternure, interestingly, is the same neighbourhood where Eva Brennan, another case, uh, attended church on the day she disappeared. Claire, like Eva, was a similar age and described by her family as shy uh, and retiring and a bit of a, a creature of habit and that's very much uh, the same way you would describe uh, Claire, Claire Boylan. On the morning of Sunday, the 2nd of March 2003, Claire informed her family that she intended to travel to Tullamore, County Offaly in Ireland to meet an old school friend and she left her family home. However, Claire's friend would later inform Gardaí, that's the Irish police, that Claire never made contact with her to arrange a visit on the 2nd of March, nor did Claire contact her friend subsequently to the day she disappeared. No evidence has emerged that Claire ever actually travelled the 100 kilometre distance from South Dublin to Tullamore. She was formally reported missing by her brother Bernard on Tuesday the 4th of March 2003. No evidence or substantive leads in our missing person investigation has ever emerged as to where Claire may be or if she was even the victim of a crime. Uh, before I bring in Kieran and he can give his early thoughts on this case uh, I just want to say where we're going. This, honestly, is probably going to be... We, we've done in, in recent weeks, months, we've covered an awful lot of the, the so-called vanishing, or in vanishing triangle uh, cases. This is probably going to be the last one we do, because as I have regularly hinted at when I do these timelines, they're getting more difficult, because as we go through more and more cases particularly these cold cases that are historic, we're finding it harder and harder to get information, and particularly where there's a span where there hasn't been much progress. And I think we both now feel that going forward, if we cover any more of these vanishing um, triangle cases uh, within Ireland, it's better to do it, much as I did it, if you notice, early this week when I did an update on the uh, Imelda Keenan case, I think that's probably a better way to go where maybe a family doesn't appeal uh, it's an anniversary I think it, it's better to cover any remaining cases that we haven't gone into like the Eva Brennan case uh, there are other cases that uh, we haven't fully covered uh, Fiona Pender I think uh, uh, is it um, Maria Kilmartin was another case there are still maybe a s small handful of cases that we haven't covered and really at this stage, I think we're at a point where you just feel that you're just repeating yourself over and over again. And and we don't want to get into that syndrome of covering these cases. And that's not to say every one of these cases is not worthy of a full timeline, but it's getting harder. And even this case 
in particular, I f- still found it hard to put together a full timeline in the way I might have put together for, oh, let's say the Annie McCarrick case, uh, even the Antoinette Smith case, um, the Jojo Dullard case. There's just cases like this one that don't get as much high profile in the media and it's harder particularly when the cold cases to go back and source material to put together the kind of in-depth timeline that i do i think i've got to a stage where i think we've we've exhausted the amount of cases that we can do a deep dive timeline in with all the necessary information or otherwise we just go well we're not really sure or we don't know where to go with this and it is what it is and that's why i think we're at a point it's also why towards the end of this uh, episode you'll hear us kind of talk a little bit more about giving a general summary of all the cases around the um the orange vanishing triangle uh, cases uh so look without further ado um Let's uh, let's go to Kieran and he can give his initial and early thoughts on uh, on this case of uh, Claire Boylan. So let's go to Kieran. Hey Mick, how's it going? Thanks again for uh, having me back. Um, I must say, um, fair play to you for covering this case because like there's very little on it, and even though it's actually one of like it's a more recent case, uh, there's still like very little out there. So. Fair play to you for covering it. I did add the case to my website, irelandsvanishingtriangle.com, and uh, I was able to get a small write-up on it, so hopefully we'll be able to find some more info and stuff on it. Well, yeah. Thanks again. Yeah, the, 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 this, one, this, one was, uh, this one was a tough one to do, and I underestimated how difficult it will be because, uh, as you rightly say, you think... I mean, we've both covered cases um, together, and individually going right back to the 1980s and jeez yeah. you know it, it some of those cases were easier to do than this case has been oh um, yeah it's more impossible like yeah yeah for sure and yeah, the 90s and stuff yeah. yeah but but look it it is what it is but i'm still glad we did it because it just reflects how um under uh highlighted this case has been as everybody knows uh, it's the claire boiling case so look, we're going to start off now. <coughs> we're going to do our usual deep dive into the timeline. Kieran's listening, and uh, we'll talk on pause at certain points uh, about this case. But let's get straight into it. Our timeline starts uh, just before the disappearance. Okay, so again, time capsule, time machine, think back. We're February, March 2003. Prior to Claire's disappearance, family and friends would later report to Gardy in interviews that she had been feeling tired due to being very busy at work. Claire was the retail manager of a well-known bookshop in the nearby Dublin suburb of Ratmines. That's a nearby suburb to Ternier where she lived. Despite being tired from work, Claire did not exhibit any signs of of someone planning to disappear according to our friends, family and co-workers. Now, we're going to now move on to the day of her actual dis- disappearance. It was a Sunday, okay, keep that strongly in mind. It was a Sunday, 2003, working in the retail sector and having to work some weekends at the shop, Claire would often have a day off during the week. I worked in retail during the um, 80s and 90s. This is a very common thing because even back then when shops maybe even didn't open on a Sunday, they still obviously opened on a Saturday. So it was often common for workers to write top to bottom to work um, on the Saturday, but they would have a day off during the week. So they did their five days, but they had like a rotating day during the week. So this is very common in the retail sector. So Claire would often have a a work day off during the week. It so happened that that particular week of her disappearance, uh, she had the Monday off and she informed her family that she was intending to head off 
the Tullamore which is in the kind of like the Midlands area of uh, Ireland in County Offaly to meet and stay with an old school friend. Now, just to clarify, if I haven't got it in the timeline, this old school friend was somebody obviously from a very young age she'd known. Um, Claire was 36 years of age at this stage of her disappearance. The friend herself was already married and had kids. Uh, Claire wasn't married, didn't have uh, clear kids. So on that Sunday morning, March the 2nd, 2003, we're at 10 a.m. So it's quite early on a Sunday morning. Claire leaves her home on Greenmount Road, Ternure. Incidentally, that picture that you're seeing in front of you is that's now obviously that's Google Maps from 20, I think it's November 2022. I've been down, I've walked down that road. Um, I used to actually walk sometimes from Walkinstown through uh, Ternure and places like Ratmines and Ratgar and then walk back home We're in a very long walk. I can guarantee you this is the way this place looked in 2003. It has virtually not changed much. Those houses you see left and right, the red brick buildings, that was the way they were. I'd say the only difference now... Uh, 2023 to 2003 apart from the fact that maybe there's more cars parked at the side of the road that's the only difference i can notice the foliage the hedges the houses are very much as they were nothing has changed you are very much looking at how this road greenmont avenue uh, excuse me greenmont road looked in 2003 so claire leaves her home in tenure from this road at around 10 a.m. We can't be exact on the time. It's believed that she, at the time she was wearing a casual <coughs> waistland blue jacket with a yellow collar. Having lived her life in the Ternier locale, she's a familiar and recognisable figure in the area. She walks with a distinctive stoop and would have been seen by neighbours and locals that morning out very lightly heading to the local shops or mass service at the nearby church and there there's a number of churches this is very much a I wouldn't describe it as a working class area I would describe it as a working to middle class area uh, with multi-denominational religions of people living in the area and as as I move through the pictures I know this is quite small but if you look in detail at this map here of the local area even though this is from 2023 you will see the Zion Parish Church the Church of the Latter-day Saints uh, a Catholic Church uh, convents uh, local primary schools in fact that um, uh, presentation primary school if, if I'm if I'm sure of this I actually think that's the school that Claire actually attended. She grew up in this place all her life. <coughs> um, despite informing her family that she is travelling to Tullamore on that Sunday morning in the Irish Midlands uh, to her married old school friend, Claire is not believed to have brought any kind of bag with her. Clothing, toiletries, that kind of thing. The thing you'd, you'd kind of bring with you if you were staying overnight with uh, a good friend. It's only days later after her disappearance is reported, and we'll talk more about that briefly, that a friend will state to Gardaí when she was interviewed that she had not been aware that Claire was attending, uh, was intending to visit her that weekend. And there was no specific arrangements had been made or communicated to her. However, she did qualify that by saying that Claire had visited her on previous occasions with very little or short notice so this isn't in entirely uncommon for Claire to have turned up at our friends in Tullamore kind of a little bit unannounced or with very short notice so I'm, I'm wary of reading too much into that however there are other details about the fact that she didn't kind of like bring anything packed with her for that kind of visit because this is as you can see from the map, uh, Dublin's here on the right side, and right over here into the Midlands is Tullamore, just 
down here slightly where I am. That's 100 kilometers. Okay, that's not an insignificant journey. If one, you're clear boiling, you don't drive. You haven't learned to drive, you don't own a car. And none of our friends ever reported that she asked for a lift or anything like that. So, <coughs> previously when Claire did this journey to her friend and other friends around the country, she would generally use public transport, bus and train if it was a longer journey. If Claire ever attempted this journey, that's the way she would have done it. And she would have had to have gone into the center of Dublin city to have achieved this journey. We're going to move to the following day after she's last seen by her parents leaving the home on Sunday, March the 2nd. We're now into Monday, March the 3rd. No one has seen or heard from Claire for more than 24 hours. Parents Brian and Maureen Boylan in Ternure simply assume that their daughter is enjoying her time off work with her friend. By Tuesday, March the 4th, things start to escalate. This is a normal working day for Claire. She's had her day off on the Monday. She's due in at the bookshop in Rat Mines. As a shop manager, Claire is a premises key holder, but she does not appear for her work shift that day. As the day progresses, without sighting or contact with Claire, concerns among staff start to begin. Claire is known as a very hard-working and conscientious manager. Had she been ill, normally her process would be to make provisions for her absence and arrange with another staff member as a key holder uh, to cover her shift and be there to cover for her. None of that ever happened. So her absence from work appears to be unplanned. Later in the afternoon of that Tuesday, the family of Claire begin to become aware that she hasn't turned up to work as expected. From statements to Gardaí, we know that there are calls made back and forth between Claire's workplace, friends and family. Her brother, Bernard Boylan, her parents, Brian and Maureen, now know something is not right. This is completely out of character for such a shy and conscientious person like Claire. They are concerned that Claire has had an accident, she's fallen ill, or for some known, unknown reason, she's not been able to make it back from Tullamore and her friend in County Offaly. Bernard finally contacts local Gardaí at Ternier Police Station and informs them that his sister is missing. But more disturbingly, the family soon after that learn that Claire's friend in Tullamore has neither seen nor heard from her all weekend and that there was no such meeting or arrangement was ever made for a visit. I'm going to go through March and then I'm going to ask Kieran to come back in. So let's just go through March and then at that point I want Kieran to come back in and give his thoughts. So just on March, so we're up to kind of, this was early March that she disappeared. So throughout March, following a Gardaí reported missing person and launch of an investigation, a media reach out is conducted over the following days and weeks. While tips of possible sightings of Claire are reported of her seen in our <coughs> local area, that's Ternure, the nearby Rakar and Rotten Mines, and even as far away as the west and northwest of Ireland in Galway and Donegal, no substantive leads emerge to progress the investigation. Gardy quickly established that none of Claire's personal items were missing from her family home. They can find no evidence that she planned to disappear of her own accord. Why do they know that? Well, one, her passport is found amongst her personal items at her house. But crucially, her bank account shows no activity immediately prior or to on the day of her disappearance. The only personal item that the family can figure out that's not within the home was this waist length blue jacket with a yellow collar, 
which she regularly wore around of that time. Um, Kieran. Yeah, no, very good. Oh, opening thoughts. Yeah, no, very good. Um, it's, it's just such a difficult case. Like it's, you really, this is tough. This is really tough, yeah. man. This case. It's um, the thing about like I know you kind of cleared it up there. I was kind of wondering when you said she was planned to go to Tullamore, like mm. two thousand and three. You'd send a text, wouldn't you, if you're going to visit someone? Well, I, 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 my understanding kind of is she did. She didn't have a, a mobile phone. So, okay. so she she would have had to call presumably from the landline, and I, I would, I can only presume. Again, I don't have the Gardaí case evidence in front of me to examine that of all the call logs from the house, which which I would imagine she did. But I would examined. assume that would be, you know, this isn't that we're not talking about the nineteen sixties or seventies where <coughs> if you wanted to visit a friend in Tullamore. <clears throat> you wrote them a, a letter or sent them a postcard. That's not how it worked then. You just picked up the phone at the landline of the house and you said, uh, uh, Marie or, or, or Francis, uh, uh, am I all right to head up and meet you uh, this weekend and stay over? That kind of thing. So I would assume she did it by her primary contact was by landline. And my understanding is when she went missing, the communications between the shop in Ratmines, um, the family... Bernard, the brother, and some of the other siblings all occurred through landlines back and forward or when Bernard was at work and was going, what the hell is going on here? Mom, Dad, you know, where is she? So that was all going on yeah. that afternoon. So uh, it the was fact, quite... Um, sorry, the fact that um, it was a close friend, maybe she could show up and knock into her house. You yeah, know, we said there was that, a that, seemed to, that seemed to be the understanding, that, that Claire, yeah. any time, they, they seemed to be quite close that Claire at any time could turn up. But if she went to uh, Tullamore, you would think there'd be evidence of that, like in bus or a bus or... Bus or you know, CCTV, right trailing all the way. We, we've seen... K I mean, my God, if we can be shown CCTV from the Annie McCarrick case and even older yeah. cases, where, where oh, yeah. is the CCTV from this case? Let's push on to April. <coughs> Bernard, her brother, informs the Irish Times during that month, April 2003, about the circumstances that led to him reporting his sister missing. Uh, to quote him, She had a day off on Monday, so when she didn't come back on that date, we were not too worried, but it would be very unlike her not to go to work on Tuesday. She's a shop manager and is not the type of person to leave people in the lurch. She's very conscientious. Her family also tell Gardy that Claire often went walking around Tenure. These such reported sightings in that early two weeks of March they stop not stop being reported but rather the, the coverage of period that people claim maybe to have seen her seemed to stop around the 15th of March 2003, just under two weeks since Claire is last seen at her parents' home. However, Gardy since then now believed that most of these sighting tips that were given to them at the time, back in 2003, are either mistaken identity or their timing errors and that it is unlikely Claire was somehow within her locale for two whole weeks, but just never actually visited her own home on Greenmount Road. That somehow she was within her locale after the day of her disappearance, but somehow she just doesn't go home and she eludes detection by CCTV footage at local shops, um, roads, avenues from multiple premises in the area. <coughs> I don't think that makes any rhyme, reason or sense. That somehow somebody who goes missing is kind of secluded, sequestered or hiding out in their own locale, but is not seen by anybody at that time. It, it, that, it just doesn't make sense. And then Mick, sorry, just one thing. Do you know if there was any um, like missing person photos put up around that time, like the posters? I, be I, believe, I believe the family did um, put up, but it wasn't 
by it wasn't by any way, shape, or means what we mm. would be familiar with with a huge national campaign. No, but they would have put them up, say, around uh, Terry abs- yeah, Absolutely. So it's unlikely she, that Claire Boyle abs- would have been absolutely. walking around. Ber- Ber- yeah. Ber- Bernard see, and, and Ber- his Ber- two Ber- parents, Ber- although they were elderly in their 70s, they were very, very active with the community. And again, to emphasise, Claire was a very recognisable figure walking in that area. She regularly took walks in that area she lived there her whole life. She you know. lived there her whole life. You know, th- this is not a person who just drifted in, was living there in a flat or an apartment, and maybe for, you know, a year or two, and then disappeared. This is a person who lived in that leafy suburb. She was well known, and neighbours and people would have been familiar with her work pattern, you know, leaving either in the morning or the afternoon to go to work, uh, coming back, you know, people were very familiar with our routine. On August the 18th, 2003, which actually happened to be Easter Good Friday, a bank holiday weekend, along with members of the Guardian investigation team, the family make, I think this was the really the first major significant public appeal for more information because the Guardian were just running into it basically a brick wall there was they were getting no real information other than sporadic reports of maybe she was seen in the Ternure area um the Ratgar area at the time which didn't seem to make sense <coughs> things progressed this is actually an article I'm not expecting you to read this um um it's an August 2003 article and one other significant point Claire's let me just qualify. Claire was one of, I think it was six siblings in the family. Claire was the youngest. Her parents, remember, um, Claire's 36 years of age. Her mom and dad were actually in their early to mid 70s. I think the mother was 74. I think Brian was 77. You know, they weren't young parents they were quite you know getting into their elderly years in their 70s and Claire was aware at the time that her mother Maureen age 74 she wasn't in the ideal health that year and in fact she had subsequent surgery and problems later that year that was something Claire was very aware of and again it leads into that idea that would Claire not have shown concern for her mom to let her know look I need to disappear for a few weeks I just need to get my head together on something would she not have let her parents her elderly parents know that she's okay she'll be back but I just need some time out again it doesn't make sense in May 2003 um, a national RTE crime and reconstruction of Claire's disappearance is broadcast on national uh, Irish TV. Unfortunately, I don't have a record. It's not in the archives. Uh, I'd love to have done an insert here and brought you that um, reconstruction. But I suggest it's nothing better than what I'm presenting here and it doesn't have a great more detail than what I'm presenting here. Um, 2003 to 2023. Unfortunately, that's the leap we're going to have to make now because Claire Boylan, as I said, a total of five other siblings she was one of six three of whom um live in dublin whilst the other two live in germany and america uh she's the youngest unfortunately claire has not contacted any of her sisters or brothers since the day of her disappearance on sunday march 2nd 20, 2003 whilst in her 20s claire did attend a university in wales the uk and had made some friends throughout scotland england and wales these friends have over the years on a regular basis been contacted by the investigation teams and they have continued to confirm and um, just like Claire's family that they've never since the day of her disappearance had any contact with her over that 20 year period Um, Kieran, any more thoughts before I start the, the full analysis and conclusions uh, thanks, Mick. Uh, now, just um, 
you were saying about she left her passport behind, but I suppose you could travel to Britain without a passport. You, I, I think you're always advised to bring it, um, but yeah. no, I, as far as I know, and certainly back at that time, things might have changed now with, with, with Brexit and all that nonsense. Um, but certainly yeah. um, back at that time, yeah, you, you could travel to the UK without any problem if you didn't have a passport. Once you had some kind of formal uh, ID, if you were stopped okay. half the time <coughs> I travelled to the UK uh, by ferry uh, I, I can't even remember back in and around that era uh, and the 90s I've ever been asked for oh we need to have a look at your passport it was like it's like getting a bus a sea bus yeah. across the, the, and that was the end of it like yeah. so yeah 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 technically the lack of a passport left at home doesn't remove the the absolute possibility that she could have but then where would she go um she 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 went over there she doesn't bring a bag there's nothing missing from the house none of the friends and people that she knew and built up a relationship um ever said they ever heard from her it it just again it doesn't seem to add up and uh, do you know did she have a boyfriend or a partner or anything i am not aware of any of that detail I'm not aware on oh, on on I can speculate but yeah there there's probably a little point in me speculating on that uh, I I have no information beyond that she was considered shy I wouldn't say reclusive but certainly shy and retiring yeah, and quite enough. a I'm traditional kind of person Fair enough I was going to say do you know um what church she went to that day I don't that, but I did mention churches in the area. I, I did describe the area as quite a, you know, what's the word? It, 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 it's, it's an area where there's a, an awful lot of churches from different denominations. It, yeah, it was yeah. very much the kind of area. Um, I don't know whether she attended. I don't know how religious she was. I don't have any information okay. on that. And I'm not aware in any of the articles that I privately shared with you uh, from the archives that there's ever any speci- In some cases there are, but in this particular case, there's no specific mention that, yes, she was quite religious or yes, every Sunday yeah, she went to mass. There's, I, I have no information on that. So it will be unfair okay. of me to speculate beyond that or, and try to link or tie something into that. I, I don't know. I honestly and don't know. Uh, one kind of interesting thing I suppose I found while researching the case because like there's very little even if you just do a yeah, simple yeah, Google, there like, is. you know. But you know, um, Garrett O'Callaghan, he's quite a credible journalist. You know, he was on he two FM. Yeah. All these well, things, yeah. Pr- pr- presenter more than journalist, <laughs> and, and yeah. But yeah, okay. He did. Um, he, he I just found on his Facebook that um, not just now, obviously a few years ago, that he was did some investigative journalist journalism and looked into the um, he was looking into the Philip Kearns case and basically I'll just sum, summarize his post. He basically concluded that Philip Kearns went missing in nineteen eighty six. Hmm. Eva Brennan went missing from Terra Nure in ninety three. Ninety three. And yeah. Claire Boyle in Terra Nure in two thousand three. So ten. Were killed by yeah. yeah he's, outrightly stated were killed by the same man one brian ellis who was from um the place called bushy park i think in terra Europe. yeah I, I checked out uh brian ellis um quite the uh quite and, the statement <laughs> yeah it's it's quite a and I'll, all i'll qualify it on that is garrett is entitled to say whatever he wants to make whatever claims he wants but this, I would say, is not the first time that Garrett has made a claim on a case without providing substantive backup and detail to it. Other than, I talked to somebody privately and they told me this. And I talked to that person privately and they told me that. Um, we, we had other things that he said in and around the Philip Cairns case. Yeah, and there was, if you go back true the thing there is a good yeah. bit of still funny yeah should i say you know <laughs> if in my mind and i'm speaking solely as a journalist if in my mind you are going to name somebody 
and in this case he named Brian Ellis from the mm. Ternior area if you were going to name that person and this person I should emphasize is now deceased if you're going to name that person and he also named um Some, uh, a Fox priest uh, I think yeah. it was Father mm. Patrick Tui if you're going mm, to start yeah. naming those people and make accusations and then say oh but I've I've talked to the Guardian and passed on this information that's great that's fine but if you are going to publicly instead of privately make those substantive claims against somebody you need to fucking back up those claims and say yeah. and not just say well I talked to a bloke in the pub or I talked to this person or somebody phoned me last night that's not Would acceptable to, um... that's not good enough you need to be more substantive than that or would you otherwise have to, sorry Mick would you have to provide your sources to the Gardaí what's the story with that Um. yes I, I believe you, you would yeah, okay. because it, one you're not going to be taken seriously if you just say uh, yeah, this yeah. this person or that person told me but I can't really talk about um, not, no no sorry that's not and at times Gareth has indulged in that kind of thing that's not acceptable okay. You know, if you make claims about somebody, whether they're living or deceased, and very specific accusations that yeah, they sure knew they very specifically three people that are potentially all deceased and potentially were all either abducted or murdered, by Christ, you better put it on record, not just with the Gardaí, but if you're going to go public as well with it, which he has, then you better yeah, put it on record. Yeah. What your backup and what your detail is. Gardy can't stop you from going public about it. He's a public figure. He's entitled, if he wishes to speak publicly about it, that's fine. And he has, but he's not been substantive about it. And that's my concern when you make accusations. Yeah, fair enough. So, on our case analysis and conclusions, like some old cases, old cold cases, this has been a difficult one to formulate any kind of accurate and detailed timeline, simply due to the complete lack of evidence and any absolute verified witness sighting following Claire's disappearance. In fact, the subsequent official case reviews by Gardy have yet to reveal or disclose any substantive line of inquiry, despite media su uh, suggestions that it could be another case connected to the so-called vanishing triangle of women in Ireland. No direct link can be made with any other case beyond some tentative profiling the case of Claire Boylan sits as something of I would at least describe it as an outlier <coughs> even all, all things considered with the so called connections re Brian Ellis with the Eva Brennan case who was also from Tenure Rakar area of Dublin mm -hmm. for me substantive wise other than age I think uh, Eva was 39 we haven't fully covered that case. Yeah, you might, that, we've yeah. mentioned it before. Uh, and the fact that she was also from the Ternier Rakar area. There's no yeah. other <coughs> substance of information in the public arena to suggest there's any connection with the cases. There neither has been found. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. So, some questions here. Um, did Claire Boylan choose to go missing? I... I, I, I it's a question I have to ask and it's the first question I ask myself when we're looking at somebody who's gone missing. Did they deliberately go missing? Did they want to go missing? For a quite shy, conscientious and punctual planner, a creature of habit, this seems highly unlikely. But I'm left with one niggling concern about the circumstances of this case. And here it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Why did Claire make it clear to her parents, Brian and Maureen, that she was going to visit her friend in Tullamore that Sunday morning and yet depart her home with little or nothing to suggest such a trip of 100 kilometres. One would have thought that she might have made some withdrawal of cash from her bank account for her buses, train fare, meals, etc. Maybe on the morning of Sunday, March the 2nd, that was her intention, but it certainly never happened. Something else changed her plans and time out. She also took no known clothing provisions for her relaxed stay over. <coughs> the last bit is the biggest anomaly for me and I think I touched upon it I don't know whether I mentioned it 
when I showed you the map of the area of of Ternure and uh, the fact that you would have to go into the city center uh, to go to Tullamore. I actually checked, and literally I checked it. We're recording on Saturday, second of September, twenty twenty three. I actually checked as if I was going to Tullamore tomorrow from Ternure and I could not see a way I could get out of Ternure to Tullamore that early in the morning at 10am. I couldn't see a private coach, bus service, uh, a proper rail service. The earliest I could plan and configure a journey was around 1 to 2 o'clock. And incidentally, by bus, that's about two hours, 50 minutes from door to door to a friend, from Ternure to a door of a friend. Uh, you might do it in about two hours uh, if you're using rail. And I went, doesn't that strike me then that that's a very f- odd time, an early time on a Sunday morning to be leaving? I mean, if I'm struggling to do that journey in 2023... What the hell was yeah, that well, journey like in 2003, 20 years, ago, 20 years ago? Whatever Claire Boylan told her parents, I don't actually accept what she told her parents. I think in her own mind, um, if she was ever intending travelling to Tullamore that morning, because we've no evidence, CCTV, bus, train, stations, uh-huh. witness accounts, preparation for it, beyond her having free time away from work for a couple of days, even modern 2023 transport timetables make a journey that early in the morning difficult. Could there be have been someone else she was planning on meeting that weekend as a shy and private lady and she was reluctant maybe just not to say anything to her parents or family? Yeah. Could be onto something there, mate. Yeah. yeah. Had she been heading to the Irish Midlands, she would have had to travel to the city centre in Dublin Whatever about far-flung witness sightings over the next two weeks, that was in reference to Galway and Donegal. Yeah. Uh, the most important ones are the people who may have saw her and recognised her that Sunday morning, uh, early, going about their business, maybe going to Mass, going to get the newspaper, litre of milk, after 10am, in and around the ter- tenure area. They would seem to me, to to the Gardaí investigation, to be the most important. Not the far-flung reports of maybe she was in Galway, maybe she was in Donegal, maybe, you know, they seem the more important. And there doesn't seem to be too many reports. So, Claire Boylan vanished uh, through whatever circumstances, planned or unplanned, far closer to home that morning. Much like the cases of Amelda Keenan, Patricia Doherty, Deirdre Jacob, Fiona Sinnott, I believe that the person responsible for their disappearances, abductions, deaths, was known to them to some degree. Now, I want to stress, because I know it could be on some subscribers' and viewers' minds, uh, the case of Claire Boylan is not connected to Larry Murphy. Murphy was already in prison um, by this time uh, of... Claire's disappearance and it was actually something I almost forgot to mention it was Kieran that reminded me of this during the week when we were researching this case so let's just put that one to bed straight away as a distraction to this case <laughs> moving on to our final thoughts and summary of the um, I suppose Kieran, I want to kind of do a wrap up on the so called as we keep referring to it Ireland's vanishing triangle uh, sadly, I, I should just mention that Claire's parents, Brian and Maureen, they actually passed away several years after her daughter's disappearance. They're never going to know uh, what happened to uh, their daughter. Someone who knew Claire um, within our locale lightly has information on that. Um, with in-depth analysis and actually looking at the cases we've covered over the past few months regarding the so-called vanishing triangle it's that the vast majority of cases that certainly that we've looked at 
clearly are not linked by suspect or circumstances, even in cases where bodies have been recovered. We've highlighted in recent months a few cases where there may be some profiling links regarding locales, modus operandi. We spoke about this over the last month with the... It's highly Patri- circumstantial. Really. Highly, highly no. circumstantial with the Patricia Doherty and Antoinette Smith case will be the two obvious ones we would really heavily highlight and say, hey, you know, if your Voicast system at Gardaí headquarters yeah, is not screaming, you, you know, yeah. there's a possible connection here, then you want to talk to your uh, people where you pull information from because if you haven't seen this and we can see it you know you've got a problem yeah but there is still a media perpetrated idea and Kieran and I have read many books we've still got some of them sitting on our table that we read um, that very much perpetrate this idea and subject of the vanishing triangle that there's some singular predator responsible for the deaths of six to eight Maybe more women in the east of Ireland from the late 1980s right through to the 2000s it doesn't stand up to any real scrutiny and I'm sure the Gardaí know that it's the media who keep professing this all the time what is clear and perhaps more of a concern the name that sounds is that many of the cases we've examined already have primary suspects in some cases we can name them there's other cases that Karen and I have covered, both in his podcasts and in our shared video casts, that we can't for legal reasons name. But we know in a lot of these cases there are suspects. And it's just, they're known to Gardaí. They were known to the victims at the time. But as yet, critical forensic and witness disclosure evidence missed or not yet obtained has resulted in a number of cases not meeting the requirements to formally make an arrest and convince the Irish DPP, Department of Public Prosecutions, of a successful conviction. So in other words, across more than two decades, 87 right through to 2003, where we are right now with this case, Ireland certainly had quite a number of opportunistic predators and it's unlikely there was any one single serial killer. Rather, Ireland had a number of very dangerous predators who either operated alone. We've looked at people and spoken about them, people like Larry Murphy, John Carrera, uh, convicted people within their locales, or they were associated with other predators within a circle to identify easy targets to stalk in South Dublin and Wicklow. And the isolated wilds of the mountains were simply their collective ideal deposit grounds like so many predators and terrorists. And we've seen that with provisional IRA groups right back to the 1960s. That was a known ideal place to deposit bodies. Kieran, last thoughts. Oh, and just the the time would have helped these people get away with the crimes as well, you know. Absolutely, like a yeah. And phone, phone, like, tracking, mobile you know, tracking, that. GPS, yeah, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just kind of just the way it was. Like, the, it's one of them. The more you know, kind of the less you know, <laughs> in a sense, yeah. you know. And and it's easy for us, as difficult as the case might be, to go through and pull information out we can appreciate and understand why there were maybe failings or shortfalls in Gardaí investigations because they didn't have the information. You, I, I always say this. It's like, no, don't it's like a, yeah, it's yeah. like a time machine. You can't take what we know now and what the technology, whether it's forensic DNA, um. CCTV, GPS tracking, mobile phones, uh, internet tracking. You cannot take that and in that mindset of now and apply it back to a case of the 1980s and 1990s. It doesn't work. That's not... It was a different culture, a different period of time. You know, we've talked about how many women uh, did we talk about and touch upon, I think, at least three or four cases where... Women yeah, still yeah. actively hitchhiked. At yeah. Crazy times of night. 
would flag yeah, down cars, things. taxis, you know. And you thought, that's bonkers now to think about that. Would a woman, a young woman, do that now? And yeah, the reality is, it's you have not to be judgmental. That was of its time. And that's the way people did things. Oh, yeah, Particularly young men and women in rural towns where missed the last bus, came out of the pub or the nightclub. Uh, shit, you know, uh, oh, home is 10 or 15 kilometers away. How do I get there? Oh, I'll stick out my hand and might get a taxi or uh, maybe uh, Joe or Ned or Frank is passing through uh, at this time at finishing work and I'll grab a lift with them. That's the way people operated in <coughs> rural areas of Ireland. So just hopefully for the families now because like, a lot of them be getting older and stuff. They, and and they, that's the other thing and then people all, say, well, why, do, why don't we hear more from the families? And in, in some of these cases, we're, we're talking about one, two, some cases, three decades. My God, I covered a case there. You'll have seen recently the, the last weekend, the Nora Sheenan case that was resolved after 40 years. You know, know yeah. her, not only has her parents departed this world, her siblings, her friends, yeah, you know, have, have, have long got, there is nobody there to is champion their cases. Even, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. with DNA evidence, uh, with maybe somebody being honest and coming forward and saying, hey, I haven't told you this, but this is what I actually knew back then. Yeah. That's the only yeah. way some of these cases get resolved. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. Look, uh, Claire Boylan, that was the case. Uh, I'm glad we did it. Uh, unfortunately, I wish more people uh, had to cover this case. It seems to have taken us to cover it, to highlight it. But there well, you go. It's out there now. Yeah, anyway. yeah it's, it's out there now. Uh, we've yeah. done it. And hopefully for Bernard and his family, there's some resolution in the coming months uh, and years if it takes it. And something oh. or someone comes forward to say, Look, this is what happened. This is what happened, Claire. This is where she is. Um, okay. That's it for myself and Kieran for this episode. We'll have something a little bit different for Radio Spoils, uh, episode 35, in the coming uh, week or two. Very intriguing case we're, we're thinking of doing. Um, until then, God bless, take care. Thanks, and uh, we'll see everybody uh, soon. Okay. Thanks, Mick. All out. Take care.